get started. So of course we have our attendance form. Uh, Corwin ran into unexpected difficulties of waking up on time, so he will uh, be here shortly, but for now, I will cover for him. Okay, well, we will move on to some quick announcements in the meantime. So, your hack challenge again will be coming up relatively soon. Uh, it's, there's no big uh, rush to start thinking about your ideas yet, but it's a good idea to start thinking about what you can use in these lectures to uh, potentially come up with a feasible idea for what your hack challenge will be. Of course, once you actually start the hack challenge, you'll be working with a full group, with a full team, to come up with your idea. And so, uh, no pressure for now to come up with your idea, but it's a good idea to start thinking about it. And of course, your homework five will be due in usual time next Sunday at midnight. Okay, so today we will be talking about fragments. Uh, now, what exactly are fragments? Well, fragments are uh, sort of similar to activities, but not quite the same. It's, it's sort of a mini activity in the sense that you can, they are sort of a view in an activity that you can swap out and replace with new fragments. So it's not exactly a full activity in the sense that it's a whole new screen, but it's sort of a part of an activity that's as fully fleshed out as one, but you can, that only takes up a small portion of the screen and then you can swap out for other fragments. So here, on our eatery screen, uh, we can see the main activity is, of course, the entire screen, the entire eatery screen, but the different fragments are uh, these main parts of the screen here, from, well, not including the bottom bar, but everything in the orange boxes. These are all fragments that are being swapped out every time you say click on a new button, a button here on the bottom of the gate bar. Every time you say click here, this fragment will be swapped out for the main eatery one. Click on this one, it'll be swapped out for the weekly menu fragment, and the same thing for the login fragment. So the fragment is not necessarily an entire screen, but it is something in a screen that can be swapped out and replaced with other fragments. So why use a fragment over, say, uh, just an activity? Welcome, Corbin. <laughs> uh, why use a fragment over just an activity? Well, it allows you to re reuse your UI components without having to, say, commit to a whole another screen. So on the Eatery app, we don't have to say, open up an entirely new screen every time we want to move to a different section of the app. We can just swap out the fragment, and it's much faster and much cleaner. Uh, of course, this will also, being able to reduce, or being able to swap out these screens very easily will allow us to reduce the redundancy in our code base by, instead of making entire screens, just being able to swap out bits of our screen in order to achieve the same goal. Just like this, step in. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. Alright, so let's talk about the life cycle of each one of our fragments. I've also lost my voice over the weekend. <coughs> so the life cycle of an event is very similar to those of an activity. The main difference is that the fragment life cycle is tied to the host activity. So say for example here we have an activity that is tied to two different fragments. Well, what would happen is that if the activity goes, uh, is paused, then the fragment will also be paused. If the activity is terminated, or like uh, if, the, yeah, if the activity is terminated, the fragments will also be terminated as well. So 
in essence, the fragments are linked to the life cycle of an activity that it is within, and it uh, has almost identical, uh, what's it called, life cycles to them. Uh, so, this is just a demonstration of what happens, where, say for example, uh, fragment A uh, is, what is it, uh, it's dismissed, terminated, well, the activity is not, right, it still remains, however, say for example, the activity is terminated. Well, in this case, the, both the fragment A and fragment B will be uh, terminated as well. So, this is the, what's it called, this is the base code for when you create a fragment, but you will see that it is pretty similar to what it looks like when you're creating an activity. There is an onCreate function, this is just handled for when you actually create the uh, fragment, just like what would happen if you try to create an activity. And then you have the, uh, this, uh, you have this companion object, and this is just to uh, give arguments into your new fragment. So here we see we are trying to pass in strings into this actual fragment. So for example, uh, here our fragment contains a text view. Well, we want to actually pass in the text that we want to populate the fragment with. So from the activity, we pass in strings to actually populate this text view that we've created within this fragment. Now let's talk about integrating the fragments into our activities. So fragments can be added uh, programmatically through existing view groups, uh, usually frame layout, uh, which we've introduced briefly in week two, uh, are used since the purpose of frame layouts is to block areas uh, that are required to fit the largest child view. Uh, if you use frame layouts as fragment containers, uh, you are ensuring that you always have enough space to accommodate the largest fragment uh, layout. So, to actually integrate a fragment into an activity, you add a fragment into XML, and then you add the fragment uh, programmatically into the existing uh, view group. <coughs> so, uh, when integrating fragments into an activity, there are two specific things that you have to be aware of. There are fragment managers and there are fragment transactions. So the fragment manager manages all of the fragments in one activity and the fragment transactions can be applied to fragments, uh, or actions that can be applied to fragments, which include creating, launching, and caching these fragments. So at runtime, a fragment manager can add, remove, and replace, uh, and perform other actions with fragments uh, in response to the user interaction. So each set of fragment changes that you commit is called an transaction, which is why we have this fragment transaction uh, that, what's it called, deals with all these things. And you can specify what you do inside a transaction using an API provided by the fragment uh, transaction class. Uh, you can group multiple actions into a single transaction. So say for example, a transaction can be used to add or replace multiple fragments. Uh, this grouping can be useful um, if you have groups of sibling fragments uh, all together on one frame. So say for example, you have multiple different uh, things you wanna reload, you can all do this one fragment instead of multiple, which is both more efficient and it is easier to code. Um, next. So here is the actual code uh, for transactions and managers. So uh, the first one here is just adding a fragment into some container, while the second one is actually replacing the current fragment uh, with another one. So, and we will demonstrate these two uh, activities within our demo. Uh, so. <clears throat> so this is how we 
actually make a fragment, and this is the easiest way to do it, we go into File, New, like what we do when we try to make an activity, and here you can see there is a uh, tab that says Fragment, right? And then we just click on it and it will create the starter both XML and column file out of the fragment. This is so that this makes it so it's way easier because uh, this populates all the syntax so you don't, you don't have to, uh, as well as makes it so that you uh, are introduced to both of the files, both the XML and column file. Uh, this is very similar to activities uh, where it can do the same thing. You see activities right above it, where you click on it and it will also create the XML and column file. Uh, doing this makes it so that it's actually it actually links these two files together. Um, because if you try to do it by yourself, the files are not organically linked. You'll have to add some stuff into your uh, what's it called uh, Android XML file, I believe, as well as uh, populating yourself, which is kind of annoying. So it does it here for you. Next, there is sharing data between fragments. Uh, one of the reasons why we want to do this is because fragments are technically independent of each other and maybe one fragment is contingent on some information on another fragment, right? Uh, and so you might, there is real reason why you would want to pass information between fragments. And in some cases, you may want to pass a one-time value between two fragments or between a fragment and its host activity. For example, you might have a fragment that reads QR codes and passes that data onto the previous fragment or the activity. Uh, when fragments communicate with each other, <coughs> they should do so without holding references of the other. To do this, we can leverage the fragment manager. Uh, the Fragment Manager acts as a central storage location for the Fragment results. The Fragment sets results and listens. Oh, sorry. The Fragment sets results and listens for those results and acts upon them. Uh, the Fragment Manager can also leverage to facilitate communications between fragments and the host activity. So here we see. Uh, oh, here we see uh, Fragment A is setting a listener and it is listening to the request key, right? Uh, and uh, here we also see fragment B, it is setting a fragment result, and it has a rest, uh, what's it called? And it has a request key, which is simply the key um, that is linked to the actual bundle, which is the actual information you want. So this is kind of like a dictionary where we have a key that points to the actual information right here, uh, we have the fragment manager that collects all of, it listens to all of the inputs, and then it will send the actual inputs to people, to fragments that actually request that specific key. So this, it has a request, and show, it sends a result with the request key plus the bundle, and the fragment A will actually get that key or get that information because it has sent a listener who requests for that specific key. Here we have a quick peek at the set fragment result listener. This is some of the syntax uh, that you will need to actually implement in order so that your fragments can listen to each other. Uh, you can send the results uh, to these listeners with set fragment results, which takes in a key and a bundle uh, and sends it uh, to the listener. Uh, so we have a bunch of comments here. And this is just simple, basic syntax uh, that you guys don't have to memorize. As always, uh, you can always come to these sides, back to these sides, and refer to them. Next, we, we will want to actually introduce navigation. Fragments are very conducive to helping navigate between different screens. First, let's introduce the way Android offers navigation natively. So we have the bottom navigation views. Uh, you might have seen this in many of the apps that you use, as it is here, both in uh, what's it called, Airbnb, and I believe that's uh, Uber Eats. I think. 
Uh, what this does is it makes it easier for users to switch uh, at a top level between different screens and across activities with a single tap. Uh, they should do this when the application has three to five top level distinct screens. And it makes it very easy and it's very easy to implement this with the fragment pattern as each one of these different tabs can be represented easily through a fragment itself. So why do we need the bottom navigation bar? It allows the users to switch to, uh, between different activities and fragments easily. It makes it so that the user is aware of different screens being available uh, at the very uh, top level of the app. And it makes it so that the user can check uh, which screen they're on at any moment. So you might be wondering why do we actually use an fragment instead of just activities in general when we are navigating with this bottom navigation view. Well, you will see and uh, that the bottom navigation view actually takes up a portion of the screen. And what an activity inherently is, is an entire screen. So if you say, for example, click in between these buttons at the bottom, what will happen is that if you use an activity, you will have to actually reload the entire navigation uh, bar at the bottom, which is not something that you want. Right. You want to maintain this bottom part while changing the screen up top. And that is the reason why we use fragments. So for the bottom navigation bar, we have a dependency, uh, which is just a library. You have to put this dependency into your Gradle file. And uh, it is just a, a library that you need to add in order to actually use this bottom navigation bar. So the bottom navigation bar requires the use of a new type of XML value called a menu. Essentially, menus are a list of items, each of which has their own attribute. Each item on the navigation bar or each item on the menu will correspond to and generate a new tab uh, on the bottom uh, nav bar automatically. So if we see here, for example, we have a menu and each one of these items here, we have home, favorite, profile, and for each one of them, we create an item uh, with the, yes, there. We have an item that is corresponding to it. And here we see that the icon, which represents the icon here, the text, um, and it makes it so that it is very easy to implement this type of stuff by simply uh, putting in some simple code. Uh, so uh, each navigation bar has its own menu attribute, which you can specify the menu to add. Uh, next, we have the uh, listener for it, right? So, uh, here with the listener to let's just say we actually want to make the navigation bar do something right what we have is we have this listener and uh, what it does is basically it has a when it dot item ID so it has an item ID for every specific item on the navigation bar and we press on it uh, what it will do is it will do whatever is in uh, those brackets there. So the on navigation item set listener has been recently deprecated in favor of on item uh, select listener, but the syntax is exactly the same. So instead of having dot uh, set on navigation item selected whatever, we have <laughs> on item select the listener. And this just makes it so that when the item is selected or you press on it, it does this specific thing. And here we have it so that the text view changes. So it changes from home. Uh, if you press on the home item, it changes to the favorite. If you press the favorite item and it shows the profile, if you click the profile button. <coughs> so uh, tab layouts provide a horizontal layout to display tabs. Uh, and here we have an example of tab layouts with uh, the very top bar it's just tabs. Uh, tab bar can be combined with other views uh, called a page, a view page or two, which allows you to simply swipe 
between it. So now instead of clicking, you can swipe between, uh, you can swipe and it will move uh, through the tabs. And this will actually, the bonus is it will trans both transition between tabs and it will automatically transition between the fragments attached to those tabs. So both navigation methods don't take a lot of overhead at all and allows for excellent ways to transition between the screens on your apps. And due to the fact that we have library, it makes it incredibly easy to actually implement as you just have to give it the icons and text and maybe go to the styling and it will turn up to look like these. As you can see, these two navbars look almost identical as well as the uh, tab bars because they are using the same base, uh, they're just using the same base libraries. So here we have the tab layout dependency, uh, which you have to implement uh, into your Gradle dependency. Make sure to add this into your module Gradle dependency and not your project. Next, we have some of the syntax. So the syntax for adding new tabs into the tab layout for each tab that you want, uh, call the tab layout uh, dot add tab and then pass in the appropriate tab data. You can also add tabs in the layout editor. So here we are doing it via text where we add it and then we set the text to home and profile. <coughs> So much like any component within Android and much like uh, the components within, uh, I mean, much like our uh, bottom navigation, the tab bar will actually not do anything unless you implement a listener. So here is the syntax for listening for both presses as well as uh, when you swipe across the screen. You can alter the code in the dot dot dots to do whatever you want, change fragments, display new text, etc. So uh, this is very similar where you have a tab that is selected, right? Uh, and you can select the tabs based on, as I previously mentioned, either tapping the tabs or swiping and based on the positions, zero, one, two, it will do a specific thing. And zero responds to the very first uh, tab location I believe is on the left um, and so forth. So if the tab is from left to right, then zero is the very left position and it can go away. I should say if it's zero to two, the other tab is the right position. <coughs> Next, we will be introducing networking, soft, uh, a soft introduction to networking. So what is the purpose of networking? Well. First of all, it is to actually retrieve data from the internet. Uh, it is to store data on the cloud and it is to sharing data and interact with other users. So say for example, you want to actually get real-time data uh, from the internet. Say for example, it, it might be stocks, it might be a post on some social media. Uh, there are plenty of times where we want our apps be able to utilize information that requires the internet. And it might not just be someone else's information, it might be our information. Say, for example, we have uh, um, stored the user information and user logins on our backend. Well, we will have to actually use networking in order to connect with our backend to ensure that when the user logs in, they're actually logging in onto their specific account. And so both that most apps are connected with the internet and as a result require internet access to use as internet <laughs> access allows us to access networking, which introduces a world of possibilities on what we can and cannot do uh, within our app. <coughs> so when we are browsing through the internet, you are just making a bunch of get requests to various Websites. What we're interested in is making get requests and post requests. So, what is a get request? Well, it is a common HTTP request type. You get basically gets information from the internet, and 
and most of the time what it does is it just pings their server so that you can and they will respond with specific information uh, so when you coordinate with a backend for example when you ping a get request you have like get and then you will have a tag that represents what type of information you want to ping and if you look online, you will see that there are a lot of APIs that you can use the get request line to request for specific information. Uh, almost every single site, uh, especially very large ones, always have a get request for you to ping their servers and get the info that you want. Uh, <coughs> so next thing we have post requests. This is actually sending data uh, to the internet. So say for example, you, tr are, you have some data that you want to give to your backend or give to a website, well, behind the scenes, you will be making a post request. But just replaces the target resource with a new, uh, with new data and delete, just deletes the data, right? So in general, most of the time you will be using both, you will be mo uh, majority using get and post requests. Uh, So let's talk about the HTTP request structure. First, we have their header. So this contains metadata about the request. Uh, this could be timestamps, author, uh, authentic authentication tokens, etc. There is the body, which contains the content of the request. Uh, so this could be like specifically a, what information you are requesting or what information you are uh, sending back. Uh, and the server will respond accordingly. So for example, the response to a get request will return the request information and the response for a post request is to give you something that confirms, yes, I actually did receive that information. So uh, <clears throat> most of the So, uh, there are a lot of libraries that are used to help make uh, networking easier. So these are just a few examples of what you can use. And today we will be using OKHTTP in this class, but there are a lot of others. And you saw previously how we had all this extra metadata we had to add in the header as well as um, the content. Well, a lot of these libraries help shrink that down to make it so that uh, you only have to write in the essentials of what you want to have in the uh, get request and then it will actually formulate the get request for example uh, automatically with the additional metadata that you, maybe you don't really know right into the actual request and so it, overall it makes the process a lot easier within networking so their permissions, these lines must go in your manifest before you access the internet, like all of our other internet permissions. Uh, well, these permissions are mostly legacy and the most recent versions expect apps to go online. Therefore, uh, they will almost always be automatically granted uh, at install time. <coughs> so there are some very basic status codes that you might want to use just so that you actually understand what is going on. So say for example, when you make one of these requests, uh, the server will actually send you a code back in order to inform you what happened. So here, if there's a one in front, it is an informal informational response. There's a two, that's a successful response. A three is a redirect. Four is something that you guys are probably the most common with see a website broke down, I believe it's 404, which is a error, a client error, and then five is a server side error. So yeah, as I mentioned that in the response obtained from a server from a post request, uh, usually have some kind of confirmation. The confirmation lies in these HTTP requests. So they just want to make sure that when you actually ping them or when you actually give them information, you know that you've actually, and they have truly received information and 
they're not just receive maybe half of the information and it's just a way to ensure that the there is the proper transfer of uh, information for us the most important one in this course will be the two we just want to ensure that there are successful uh, quests that are made <coughs> so uh, these are just more of a informal way for you to understand what these requests mean. Um, one just means, hold on, I'm giving you some information. Two is, here you go, uh, there's a like, you've succeeded. Three means further action is required. Uh, four means you screwed up. And five means the server has screwed up, right? These are just informal ways to kind of understand what these uh, statuses mean. So here we have a 404 request, right? You probably have seen it uh, if you use the internet or like, it's a considerable amount of time. It just means something has gone wrong on your side because the URL that you put in, which was a get request, does not exist, right? Now that we've gone, we've gone through a lot today, uh, so now we'll go through a demo of just fragmenting and if we have time, networking. So today I will be going through a quick demo of how to integrate fragments into your activity and uh, use a bottom navigation bar to say swap between different fragments. So first, if I want to use a bottom navigation bar, I have to get the dependency to my Gradle file. Uh, I've been seeing that some people <coughs> have been having problems uh, differentiating between the two Gradle files. Uh, this one you usually don't really uh, alter. This is the project Gradle file, as you can see here, project module is where all of your dependencies go. And so if I wanted to add a new one, I would put it here. Uh, the dependency should be on our textbook. And my, my friend mouse has disappeared on the provider. There we go. Okay, my mouse is back. Anyway. So now, uh, if you want to get the dependency, make sure you go onto our textbook and just copy paste this one right here. This is the dependency for the bottom navigation bar. You want to stick that right here in the dependencies and sync your Gradle file. As soon as, as soon as that sync is done, you should be able to go into, say, your activity and uh, actually put in a bottom navigation bar. So hopefully this doesn't take too long. <coughs> delete this hello one. So if I search now uh, bottom navigation bar, you can see it does actually pop up. I can drag it in, add some string. So now we don't actually have any information put into this navigation bar because uh, well, it's pretty much blank right now. And so if I wanted to make different tabs that you can switch between, I have to make a menu. Uh, and to do that, I can make like a new folder in here, uh, in, in my res folder, call it, or have it store values of menu. And then I can finally go into here and create a new menu resource file. I'll call this main nav menu. So here's my menu. Uh, if I want to add items to here, I'll just use the example that they have pulled up here, or at least just for the syntax, so I can replace things as necessary. So this right now has a home item and a favorites item. Each has a drawable flower. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to complete everything today, but I'm going to, in this demo, at least try to aim towards uh, sort of revamping my factorial Fibonacci calculator from before. And I actually have some drawable resources, some little icons that I definitely didn't steal off the internet to uh, sort of spice it up a little bit. Let me see if I can find it. My demo. There we go. It's somewhere here. Exclamation point for my factorial. And also a little spiral for <coughs> So 
now that these droplets are imported into my resources, I can just reference them like so. Never mind. Let's say we wanted this to be our Fibonacci, or we wanted this sorry, to be our factorial, and we could name it as such, factorial item. And uh, here we want to use our fib spiral, and name this our name it accordingly, so I'll name this one factorial and I'll name this one Fibonacci. And all of this information will be basically used <coughs> by our navigation bar in order to make our, in order to make each item in the navigation bar. So this should correspond to two items in the navigation bar, one of which being a factorial item and one, uh, one of which being a Fibonacci item. So in order to set the menu, you actually have to go down to here and set the menu attribute to whichever one. And as you can see now, the uh, navigation bar has automatically populated with the two or the two items that I uh, specified in the XML. So if I were to say build this in my emulator, you could see that I can at least press these two items, but I'm not actually able to do anything with them because I haven't added any like logic or any listeners to them so far. Uh, but hopefully Gradle does not take too long to build, and I can at least show you that the bottom navigation bar is exists. And as you can see, I can press these two, but I mean, nothing's really going to happen, as expected. So now let's say every time I click on a, a navigation menu item, I want to show a new fragment here and all this big empty space. I want to fill this up with some fragment, one of them being a factorial calculator and the other being the Fibonacci calculator. Well, uh, to sort of allow a fragment in a part of your activity, you have to use a fragment container view. And it's not going to let me make one because I didn't have any fragments. So let's first make a fragment. So in order to do so, the easiest way to do it is to file new and a blank fragment. So I'll name this first one the factorial fragment. And as you can see, it'll make all of the crazy, uh, horrible code that you don't want to memorize. All of it'll make it all for you, which is super nice. And we can do the same for our Fibonacci fragment. And it'll make uh, corresponding XML files for each one. Uh, that is not the right one. Here, here for the factorial, and here for the Fibonacci. Uh, it just says a blank fragment right now. But we will change this to, say, uh, more uh, helpful information. Uh, I'd like to change this to a constraint layout. There we go. And let's just make a quick like, little sketchup for what a factorial calculator could look like. Uh, so let's say have a center text up top here for uh, say a factorial calculator. That's not Increase that text size even bigger. text, uh, should be a number of text, and screen this as follows. Uh, something you'll notice is that this kind of almost deceptively looks like a screen, that this, this fragment almost deceptively looks like a screen. Uh, it is definitely not the same thing as a screen though, and uh, it only will kind of look like a screen. Uh, because I have this massive empty space here that I want to fill up. And so it will almost look like a screen, but it is very much different from the entire screen. And it's only going to fill up, uh, hopefully, this portion of the screen. Uh, I'm not sure why that's being sent, not being centered, but uh, it's probably some attribute lying around haunting me. Well, we'll get to that. Probably, I'll fix that up afterwards. But, okay, we have a number here that you can enter, and of course we'll want like a button to say, like, now our fragment is at least pretty much done with the visuals. So now let's work towards actually displaying this fragment on our activity main. So to do so, we'll need a fragment container view, and now we'll actually let me put one in. I just put in the default value there. 
Uh, and it's going to say some sort of error. I think I just have to pick the default fragment. There we go. And the screen will reappear. Uh, let me constrain this all around. Something you may notice is that this definitely isn't taking up the entire space. And I think that's just a quirk with constraint layout. If you click on these little constraints here, it'll switch between some presets of the constraint layout. And one of them is to sort of fill the entire width. So that looks more like what we want. We want it to fill up the entire space. So this is just the default value right now. And if I were to like, enter my code, still like pressing the navigation bars wouldn't actually do anything. It's not like my uh, bottom navigation view isn't hooked up with a listener to tell me which fragments to choose from. So even if I click on Fibonacci, nothing's going to change. So let's, well, change that. Going into our main activity, we can uh, get a reference to our bottom navigation view as we would anything else. So find view by ID. It's our bottom navigation view. And our ID, probably called bottom navigation view. And uh, in order to use bottom navigation, we have to add a listener. So of course, I'll just go to our textbook to grab the syntax for that. Uh, I believe when I type this, it'll say it's deprecated. Yeah, it'll, it'll sort of crop this out. Uh, you basically just want to ch uh, change this to set on item selected listener instead of on the navigation item selected listener. <laughs> it behaves exactly the same, just with a different name, essentially. Uh, instead of home item, I have my factorial item. And instead of here, I have my Fibonacci item. And I want to actually be able to display or change the fragment instead of just dis like changing a text, which is the preset here. Uh, sample code. I want to, if I click on the factorial item, I want to go to the factorial fragment. And if I click on the Fibonacci item, I want to go to the Fibonacci fragment. So how to do that? Well, uh, the, uh, in order to do so, you need to take a fragment manager. And the default one that is just sort of used all the time is the support fragment manager. And the syntax is dot begin transaction, uh, dot replace. You can either use dot add or dot replace. Dot add is if there's nothing in there right now, but uh, I already put a default value into there, so I do have to use dot replace in this case to replace the fragment that's currently being displayed there. So I'm going to replace it. Uh, you have to pass in the the ID of the uh, of the fragment container, and then the new fragment. So my new fragment that I want to make is a is a uh, factorial fragment, right? For the factorial item, uh, and if you make the fragments with file new fragment, uh, like with just the, the inbuilt way, you'll see here that there's a companion object that sort of packages you with a function to create a new instance of this fragment. And this is the way, or this is the, the, the definite way that you want to create new fragments. I could just like instantiate one, just like factorial fragment with the open closed parentheses, just like a constructor. But this is the uh, the better way to do it, since you can actually pass in arguments to your uh, to your fragment. So uh, in order to do that, I'll say uh, factorial fragment dot new instance. Uh, it tells me to pass in some parameters. When whenever you make a fragment, it'll just package these like random parameters for you, just to demonstrate. Uh, I'll just pass in these default values for them, so I don't have to worry about them right now. You can change these to whatever you want. It doesn't have to be strings. You can delete them too if you want. But yeah, now I can just say new instance and because I've passed in default values, I don't actually have to call anything. And uh, of course I'll have to do, I think this is uh, missing one last thing, dot commit. That will actually commit the transaction. And now we can do the same thing for the Fibonacci fragment, which is currently empty, but at least you'll be able to see that it's changing. If I have to go back here and delete the parameters of Now we can see if at least it changes the fragment. Uh, I believe it should have also messed up somewhere. So let's see, pressing these fragments, or pressing buttons now actually changes the fragment. And of course I didn't actually make the Fibonacci fragment, so it doesn't actually change to anything useful, but uh, at least we can see that it changes the fragment now, now that I've added a listener to uh, sort of programmatically change the fragment in the fragment container view. Uh, so let's actually populate the Fibonacci fragment now with some useful stuff. Uh, in order to do that, I'll probably just copy-paste the code. It's way easier to copy-paste 
uh, code in XML rather than like trying to copy paste items here. It's far easier. Oh, I hope that helps give me my constraint layout. Frame layout is uh, probably the better one for fragments, but I, I just personally prefer constraint layouts and I don't know how to use frame layouts, so I'm gonna switch to constraint layout. And of course we want to change this to uh, to the non-tree jump really. So now, when we switch between them, it should switch between the actual uh, factorial calculator and the Fibonacci calculator, which it does as, uh, or as such. Cool. So uh, I am running a little bit low on time, only have one minute now, uh, but I will very quickly show you how to sort of add functionality to these fragments. So obviously, uh, I want to be able to listen for clicks in these individual fragments. Um, and if this were an activity, I would just put this in the onCreate. It's a little bit different for, uh, for fragments. And so you'll actually want to do most of your, uh, your logic and your listening inside this function here, onCreateView, rather than the onCreate over here. Uh, in fact, that onCreate is not uh, nearly as useful as the activity onCreate, and so you'll want to be using this onCreateView. So basically what the default code is doing right now is making the fragment sort of making a new view for the fragment and then instantly returning it. But what you could do instead is sort of wait to return it, hold on to it by making a view to hold on to the view, return it afterwards, but then before you return it, now you can actually do stuff with it. So I can say get a reference to the button in here and I'll find the view by ID of the actual fragment view. And we'll wanna do normally what we do. I think it, I, Hope it's called the button. And just like so, I can uh, set on quick listener, just like you normally would. And just to test, I'm just gonna have like a little debug statement here since we are pretty much out of time. Uh, so let's say task factorial. It works, hopefully. Uh, and now we can see if pressing our button in the factorial fragment will give us this debug. Wow, that's a lot of stuff. <laughs> Every time we click on the calculate button, it prints it works. So at least we know that the uh, set on click listener is working. Uh, so that's just a quick demo for showing fragments and using the bottom navigation bar. A similar thing applies to the tab layout. If you want to use a tab layout, then just add your dependencies, get that tab layout, tab, tab layout and, and add your listeners to change the fragments. But yeah, that's all we have for you today. I guess just one little final thing, of course, that your homework five is to on Sunday at the usual time. But thank you all for coming. Uh, have a good night, as always. We have the latest time slot in the, in the world, but yeah, thank you all for coming. This is everything we have for you today. Oh, and attendance form, right? For people who have missed it.